All right, welcome back, everyone. And then welcome back. Dropped, I know so lunchtime is just this close away, but we got a couple, two more amazing speakers that I, I'm sure will be worth the wait. Our next speaker is a very close friend of mine, one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, she is, I like to say I'm a professional atheist, but I think the only thing that comes even close to it, or maybe even exceed it, is being a professional queer. And she works, at the, <laughs> she works at the only, if I'm, if I'm correct, the only LGBT youth center in Texas. And Youth First Texas just uh, near downtown Dallas. So please give a hand to Dorian Mooneyham. Thanks. <laughs> so a little bit about me. Kevin touched on most of it. Um, I'm the blogger of Trans and Godless. Uh, which you may or may not have read. I'm the center manager for Youth First Texas, which is the only LGBTQ youth center in the DFW area. Uh, we do have another branch in Collin County, so hopefully we can spread the homosexual agenda a little bit more. <laughs> um, I'm a psych student at Texas Women's University, where I'm specializing in counseling for LGBTQ youth and their allies. Um, there's fun little logos there. <laughs> uh, I wanted to start off about um, how gender develops with kids throughout their different stages and how we as adults gender children really before they're even born. Um, before birth, um, prenatal hormones are what distinguish an infant from having one set of genitals or another and sometimes those can go awry and then you get transsexuals like me or uh, any other combination. Um, but now with sonograms, the gendering starts before a child is even born. The most common question that parents are asked is, is it a boy or is it a girl? Where genuinely what we should ask is, does it have a penis or does it have a vagina? But I guess that's not very polite for society. Since we don't know their gender yet, we just know what's between their legs. Um, and you can see this with gender reveal baby showers and other themes like that. And already before the kids are even born, we're gendering them. Is it a little man or a little lady? Well, nothing. It's a infant. <laughs> um, then once the kid is actually born, it continues. Um, there's nursery colors, there's toy selection, and infants actually begin to categorize adults by gender at a very, very young age by voice recognition and face recognition. They already decide to categorize adults into those two categories. Um, and parental interaction is different also with uh, infants. Interestingly, infant boys are breastfed longer than infant girls are, um, and infant girls are usually comforted more than infant boys are, and that's even from modern-minded parents such as most of us. Uh, so it's something to keep in common. I wanted to show this picture. This is an idea for what to do if, God forbid, you should have a boy and a girl set of twins, and you don't know how to decorate your nursery, you know, rest assured, you can still have the uh, binary colors there. Uh, and then we move on to the preschool age with children. This is usually when children are kind of starting to grasp that gender exists, but they're very confused on what categorizes people. So you might have a kid who thinks that everyone who has long hair is a woman, Obviously, that's not the case, but they're trying to figure out what categorizes people by, by their gender, and they can't really settle on anything permanent. Um, it's very common for kids this age to have magical thinking about gender. While they may understand what their gender is, they often worry that they might wake up a new gender the next day or something like that. And playing with gender is very common. That's why it's very, very common for children to play dress-up, and cross-dress when they play dress-up. Every kid tries on their mom's heels. Pretty much every kid tries on makeup. It's perfectly normal. It's how kids figure out what gender is in our society. But once we move on to school age, um, gender becomes very rigid for most children. That's when we have the cootie phase. <laughs> um, this is when toy companies and other things that market to children specifically exploit the fact that children are still insecure about their gender. Usually around childhood they figure out that body, their body is permanent, 
but they're still worried about being confused for the other gender, especially boys, because they're punished very severely in our society for having non-correct gender behavior. And so you'll have extremely exaggerated gender expressions, um, and their toy selections and the style of play that they'll have will also be very exaggerated in order to accentuate their gender and to kind of mark them as not female or not male. By the time we get to adolescence, um, children begin to develop secondary sex characteristics, which distinguish them even further as to what, what uh, physical sex that they have, and therefore what gender they're expected to have. Uh, sexual orientation begins to develop. It becomes fairly obvious by the end of adolescence. Uh, they may not accept what their sexual orientation is just yet, but it's becoming younger and younger. Uh, just in my work with the Youth First Texas, five years ago, the average age that I had a youth come out was 19, and this year, the average age of coming out is 14. So it's getting younger and younger with every passing year. Um, the gender division between boys and girls lessens, mainly for dating purposes, and it's extremely common for adolescents to go through identity crises. So you might see a kid who tries on a goth phase for a little while, a punk phase, a prep phase. It's very common for the high school age uh, to go through this identity search. I wanted to talk about some of the myths that surround gender-neutral parenting or feminist parenting. Um, first one is if you raise your kid as a uh, feminist, you're actually encouraging them to be androgynous. Of course that's not the case, because if you're encouraging androgyny, you're not really being gender neutral, you're just favoring androgyny over masculinity or femininity. So the goal of gender neutral parenting is just to provide all the options for your kid. The next one is that it'll make your kid gay or it'll make your kid <laughs> trans. Luckily, you can't make your kid gay or trans, or straight or cis, for that matter, so rest assured, no matter how hard you try, your kid's just going to be what your kid's going to be. Um, there's also accusations that it's anti-feminine or anti-masculine, depending on whether you have a female child or a male child. And this isn't true because if you provide equal opportunities for your male children and your female children, they're going to have the same options either way. So it's not anti-feminine or anti-masculine, it's just encouraging all of the options to be available. Another argument is that, well, that's great, but it's really only for trans kids. And that's not true. Um, one of my favorite statistics I've come across while working with YFT is that when you encourage um, when you encourage acceptance for the LGBT community in a school by either having a GSA or protection against discrimination, it actually makes straight and cissexual kids feel safer at that school as well because it confronts uh, homophobic language that's often directed at people who aren't homosexual or transgender. So making something that's good for a small part is ultimately beneficial for everyone. Another argument is that you're just using your kids to make a political statement, that you're just, uh, I don't know, cramming your beliefs down your kids' throats as though nobody teaches their kid their own beliefs. <laughs> and another argument is that it's too adult or it's confusing or kids won't get it, that kids need to have uh, strict gender boundaries in order to understand what their gender is. I wanted to show this uh, J. Crew ad here, which many of you are probably familiar with. It was a huge controversy last year. And if you can see, this is one of the editors um, for, the, for J. Crew. And her son's favorite color is pink. And he loves to have his toenails painted, because it's fun. And Fox News and many of the other conservative and right-wing Christian folks out there were claiming that she was somehow going to magically turn her son gay by painting his toenails pink. <laughs> it's extremely common for kids this age to like to play around with gender. 85% of the time, kids who experiment with gender ultimately grow up to be straight and cis. It's only a very small percentage that do eventually grow up to be trans 
or gay or bisexual. So I wanted to move on to deconstructing the talk. And when I say the talk, I mean what's the difference between boys and girls, sex, all of those sorts of things. Um, ultimately, it's just about moving beyond all boys and all girls and penises and vaginas. If you incorporate the fluidity of sex and gender in there, not only does it give your kid a little more freedom to understand what they can do, but it makes them better allies if they ultimately turn out to be straight or cis. Um, so using some or most language rather than all or none, for instance, most boys are born with a penis, but not all of them. Most girls are born with a vagina, but not all of them. Some people are born with ambiguous genitalia, and that's intersex. That kind of language is more inclusive. It doesn't other people who might have different uh, sexualities, different bodies, different genders, and it leaves the door a little more open in case your kid has any questions. Um, answer questions honestly, which includes being, a, being okay to say, I don't know, let's find out. <laughs> and be positive and inclusive whenever you talk about different sexualities and genders. And use the gender bread person, which I'm going to show you. So this is, there's two different versions of the gender bread person. This is the first one. And it's, it, I think it's, it's easier to understand. There are some issues with it. But if you look at the four different sections on the gender bread person, you can use this with your child. Um, the first one is gender identity, which is how you feel. And as you can see, there's a scale there from woman, gender queer, man, and everyone else in between. Uh, there's gender expression, which is how you act, and that can be masculine, feminine, or androgynous. There's biological sex, uh, which can be female, intersex, or male. And then there's sexual orientation, which can be heterosexual, homosexual, or bisexual. That, I think this is a really good tool when you're talking with your, uh, with your children about what the differences between boys and girls are. And then this way you can incorporate that there's a lot more options than just the two that society generally puts in. Um, now this is the updated version, the Gender Red Person 2.0. It's a little more complicated, but I just wanted to show it to you. Basically, rather than having the sliding scale, now there's two different scales so that it can make better mixtures, I guess. Um, they both have their strengths and they both have their weaknesses. Obviously this one's a little harder to explain, but it is more accurate, so I would personally recommend using the first one when you're explaining to your children. Woohoo! Sexism. <laughs> Sexism's not about blame, and when you're talking about sexism with your kid, really all you need to talk about is how people of different genders are treated differently in society, because nobody can deny that that's not true. Um, there's different treatments for boys and girls and everyone else who falls in between. Um, maybe you might ask your kid why boys aren't supposed to cry, or why girls are supposed to like the color pink, and why they think that is. Um, whenever you see something sexist, maybe in the media, or in a show, or something that another adult says, challenge it in front of your kid, because otherwise you're consenting to that by not saying anything. And remind your kid that adults can be wrong too, one of the things my grandfather told me when I was growing up was he said, do you have stupid kids in your class? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you know what I mean. Do you have stupid children in your class? And I said, well, yeah, there's a few of them. And he says, just remember, those stupid kids grow up to be stupid adults, too. <laughs> and another way that you can make your child more comfortable with gender variation is introducing them to all the different ways that people do gender. So on this next slide I have lots of different ways that people do gender, some role models. This first one is Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc was actually burned at the stake, many people believe, because she heard voices in her head, but um, Joan of Arc was actually pressured to stop dressing like a man. So it's thought that Joan of Arc may have been transgender because when they asked her to stop dressing like a man, she said, I would rather die. So that's a pretty strong statement. I don't think it was just about the armor. 
we have Dennis Rodman from the NBA, who I, I don't, I'm not sure I, he says he's not transgender in any way, but that's a pretty gender fuck expression. So. <laughs> Uh, we have Ed Wood, who is a cross-dresser and a director of horrible, horrible movies. <laughs> There's Billy Tipton, who is a uh, trans man and a well-known uh, jazz musician. There's Kate Bornstein, who is a fantastic writer and a transgender activist. This is Chevalier Dion. His story is fairly interesting. He passed either for male or female, and in two different instances was ordered by two different countries to appear to be either male or female because they were too damn tired of being confused about what, <laughs> what he was. We have RuPaul, which hopefully everybody knows because Drag Race is fabulous. <laughs> We have Leslie Feinberg. He's a uh, trans man and an awesome writer and activist. He's the author of Transgender Warriors, and mm, a lot of what he uncovered was unknown history about transgender people throughout the ages. And I have a couple um, kids who are role models that your children might end up relating with. This is Jazz Jennings. She was one of the first well-known transgender children to come out in the media. Uh, first with the Barbara Walters story, and then so on from there. Um, this is her now that she's a preteen, but she first came on to 2020 when she was six years old. This is Bobby Montoya. She's the first transgender girl to join the Girl Scouts, which was last year. Um, this is Weewa. She is a two-spirit Native American and one of the last to be influential in uh, the Congress. And this last one is Sadie Croft, who became famous last month after President Obama gave his inaugural address, and she wrote a letter to him asking why he mentioned gay and lesbian Americans but didn't mention transgender Americans. So I just wanted to show the kids in there to let your kids know that they can be activists too. You don't have to be an adult in order to start changing the world. So when it comes to media, it's pretty hard to avoid um, cissex and straight media. They pretty much just assume everybody is straight, non-queer, and you can't really avoid it, so you can fight it with your kid. <laughs> Like I mentioned earlier, um, silence is consent as far as your kid is concerned when it comes to how you feel about sexist representation in the media or bigoted representation in the media. If you don't say something about it, then your kid will just assume that you agree with it. Um, when you do discuss it, try to discuss it and not preach. I work with about 50 teenagers and it's one of the first lessons I had to learn is that if you try to come on as an adult who's going to educate them, they won't listen to you. <laughs> if you come on as a friend who wants to have a conversation with them, then they will. And you'll learn quite a bit from them, too. So be sure to listen and give them time to talk. And know when to pick your battles. If your daughter seems to think that all doctors are male and all nurses are female, that might be more important to address than whether her Barbies only wear pink, you know, so know how to prioritize. Another fun thing you can do, it's pretty hard to avoid the mainstream media, especially Disney with younger children. So rather than avoiding it, you can just change the lessons that it's teaching your children. Like The Lion King. You could, uh, you could just frame it that Timon and Pumbaa are Simba's two gay dads. <laughs> <laughs> Finding Nemo is interesting. Um, number one, it's a non-traditional family because Nemo's mother has died. But what you can also tell your child is that in the real world, in the animal kingdom, when a clownfish's mother dies, his father changes sex to become his mother. There's Lilo and Stitch, another non-traditional family. There we go. Uh, Pinocchio and the Little Mermaid are pretty good metaphors for transitioning and transgender identities. 
Um, obviously, throughout the entire movie of Pinocchio, he wants to be a real boy. Um, with Ariel, she exhibits a lot of dysphoric behavior that she's unhappy being a mermaid and really wants to be a human. Uh, the feminist in me is not very thrilled that she decides to give up her voice in order to be with a man. But on the other hand, <laughs> you could reframe it as she's willing to give up her voice in order to be happy with herself. So, There's Mulan, which is a pretty fun gender-bending movie, especially with the uh, very satiric song, Be a Man, which is all about gender norms. There's The Incredibles, and you can talk about um, what it's like to live in the closet and have to hide who you are to the outside society. And then I have a couple fun atheist movies thrown in here for good measure. <laughs> There's Happy Feet, which in the movie Happy Feet, he ends up disproving not one but two different religions that penguins follow. The first is his own, where they worship the great Gwyn, and he ultimately proves that the great Gwyn isn't why the fish are disappearing, it's because of the aliens, which are actually humans, who are fishing in Antarctica. Um, the second one that he disproves is an emperor penguin who has his neck choked in a uh, six ring, the soda six ring things. He had, he's being choked by one of those and claims to have visions that uh, tell him the future and Mumble ends up proving him wrong too. So it's pretty skeptic friendly. And then this last one is the Ice Age. Me and my partner plan on using this to introduce how evolution works <laughs> and that humans have changed over time. So even though that's probably not what the producers wanted you to teach your kids about with these movies, you know, screw it, it's your kid. You can do what you want. <laughs> Bottom line, um, teach beyond the binary. Even if you and your family resemble the typical nuclear family, let them know that there's a lot more out there besides just the typical nuclear family, that there's all kinds of different families and none is better than the other. Um, teach them about sexual fluidity. A lot of us, our sexuality can shift and change over time and that's okay. It's not any better than one or the other. Uh, same goes for gender spectrums, and celebrate diversity. That's what's so awesome about life on the planet in general, is that there's all kinds of diversity here, and that's what, that's what makes it interesting. And teach them to question norms. Just because something is supposed to be a certain way doesn't mean that it has to be. And my last few slides, just some resources for you guys. Um, since we don't have too much time, I'm just going to show you the pictures of them, and if you go to my blog, I'll have an in-depth description of each of these books, so that'll be up tomorrow. But these are some books for younger kids. Lots of fun. Uh, some of them are about homosexuality. Some of them are about gender queerness. Uh, some of them are just fun. Some of them are about being sex positive. I think one of my favorites is Sometimes the Spoon Runs Away with Another Spoon, which is a... <laughs> which is a fabulous coloring book, I have to say. Uh, these are some books for older kids and teenagers. Uh, some of them are about transgender teens, some of them are about lesbian or gay teens, and some of them are just about how to survive being a teenager, such as the uh, Hello Cru Cruel World, 101 Alternatives for Suicide. That's by Kate Bornstein, by the way, who I showed you earlier. Um, I really want to showcase the It's Perfectly Normal book. It's a very, very sex-positive book. It teaches about masturbation, it teaches about sexual orientation, sexual variation, um, reproductive systems. It teaches all of that in a non-judgmental manner, which is really refreshing. And these are some books for parents. Uh, Transgender Warriors, I mentioned earlier, by Leslie Feinberg. <laughs> If your kid happens to be transgender, the transgender child is pretty much like the Bible of dealing with transgender children. Um, Packaging Girlhood and Packaging Boyhood are really awesome books that make you reconsider how you deal with uh, sexist advertising in particular to children. And then another personal favorite, My Mother Wears Combat Boots, a parenting guide for the rest of us. <laughs> and then that's it. I don't know if we have time for questions or not, Kevin, but...
I don't, I don't want to sound dumb, but what is cis and cisex? Cis and trans, um, those are Latin terms. They're actually, they were originally used in chemistry, but now we use them for transgender, which is somebody who's assigned gender and gender identity are different, and cisgender, which is somebody who's assigned gender and gender identity are the same. Basically, we use that rather than, I don't know, uh, genetic or normal, or a, a lot of the other language is kind of judgmental, so cis and trans are fairly neutral to each other, so I probably should have explained that earlier on. But <laughs> so, uh, you had your genderbred version 1.0 and 2.0, and um, since we kind of skimmed over 2.0 real quickly, at the bottom of, of 2.0 it was attracted to, and the one thing that I was noticing about 1.0 is that we talk about, for example, the, the range between heterosexual and homosexual, mm -hmm. but that, um, at least to my understanding, is typically about uh, who you might be sexually attracted to, and that there may be a different component with regard to romance, and I didn't know if the 2.0 covered that, or if that's not on either. It doesn't, and I would cover that because some people are romantically attracted and dif and differently sexually attracted. Uh, so it, it's hard to know at one point you want to be thorough and at what point you don't want to overcomplicate things. Uh, one of the things that the genderbred version 2.0 did do is it included asexuality. Um, let me see if I can find it. It includes basically non-categories and all of those, so attracted to nobody, uh, biological sex, including asexual, um, gender expression, agendered or non-gendered, and uh, non-gendered gender identity. So that one's a little more inclusive. It's got more categories, but it's also a little more complicated. So. Uh, there we go. Uh, I've seen research suggesting that, uh, I don't know if this is true for children, but that for adults, uh, people who are slotted into very rigid gender roles, you know, men who identify very strongly as masculine with male, you know, traditional male gender roles, women who identify very strongly with female gender roles, uh, tend to not be as happy and as functional that people who are somewhat more, not even gender fluid, but just not as rigidly uh, identified with a, with their with their gender roles tend to do, be happier and do better. Have you seen research on this? And is there any connection between how people were raised as children in terms of gender roles and how they feel about gender as adults? There is. I've seen that same research before, and I think a lot of it is because nobody really fits strictly in either of the gender boxes. And so if you're going through all of the effort in order to actually fit into the female or the male gender box, you're gonna have a stressful life because you're gonna have to suppress at least some part of who you are. Um, so it tends to relax through adulthood. You know, eventually when you get old enough, you're, uh, you just stop giving a damn what other people think. <laughs> Hopefully, anyway. So it does tend to lessen the more and more that you age. But no, it's absolutely true that nobody falls completely neatly into either of the gender boxes, so trying to cram yourself into one is stressful. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Hi. God is often gendered as male, and men typically pray to this male God. Unfortunately, women also pray to this male god. Um, if a parent has a child who is intersexed, um, what sex is the god that this child should pray to? <laughs> I'm, m nearly all of the organized religions, if not all of them, um, basically place some kind of male god above all of the other gods. The only major religion that I can think of that has even remotely hints at intersexuality or transgender identities is Hinduism. Um, but Hinduism does other, unfortunately. It categorizes everyone who's not 
male with male parts and female with female parts as a third sex, which I guess is, is a step up from being an abomination, like uh, the Abrahamic religions. Um, but that's the only religion I can think of that would actually have an intersex god in it. Unfortunately, uh, misogyny is pretty rampant in an organized religion. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, the Youth First Center that you work at mm -hmm. and what kind of, um, what kind of uh, services are provided there and what kind of volunteer opportunities you have available. So. I love Youth First Texas. I've volunteered there for four years. I've become a staff member since last year. Um, it's a drop-in safe space center for LGBTQ youth and their allies, um, basically as young as they come, but specifically we aim for 14. But if they're younger, we're not going to turn them away, um, all the way until they're 22. So once they turn 23, they age out, and then we encourage them to go on to other organizations like the Resource Center of Dallas or uh, things like that. We have a lot of programs. We're open every night of the week except Sunday and Monday. And that's mostly just because I need a break. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> um, we've got gender identity nights, which is where we unpack gender. Uh, we talk about a lot of the crazy gender norms that are in society and how they inconvenience everybody. We have drama club where the youth learn how to write screenplays, how to put on uh, productions, how to they get acting lessons. We go to see productions. So that's fun. Thursday we have big group, which is generally just... Uh, grab bag, we have guest speakers, we play games, whatever might happen. Friday night dinner is a really awesome volunteer opportunity. Every Friday we have a different group of volunteers come and they provide dinner for our youth. Uh, for some youth it's the only real full meal that they have in the week, but we sit down like a family, we eat on real plates with real silverware, and we just talk about our week. It's one of the highlights of the week the youth really love. And then we've got all kinds of different programs that we just do intermittently throughout, throughout the month or throughout the year. Um, gala prom is another big thing that we do every May because not all youth can take their partners to their prom at their high school. We have the gala prom every year where we don't give a damn who you bring to, with, to prom with you. And we don't charge them 100 or 200 bucks like their high school does either. <laughs> Um, hey, I liked your talk very much. Um, I noticed you had the David Reimer book, I think. Mm -hmm. um, fascinating story. I, I would always watch uh, Discovery Health Channel and they would have uh, stories about children born with ambiguous genitalia and then the doctor would always say, hey, well, let's just turn it into a girl. And, you know, they would hit puberty, uh, puberty and, um, you know, their world would be flipped upside down. Do you have any sort of advice for parents who would be in that situation? Like, Yeah, um, un unfortunately, we're eventually moving away from it, but it's still the norm that if your child is born with ambiguous genitalia, generally what doctors either suggest that you do or just do without your knowledge or consent is they perform uh, sex reassignment surgery on your child in order to force it to fit into one category or the other. What we're moving towards, and it's becoming more and more accepted, thankfully, is picking a gender just because it makes it easier, either, you know, boy or girl, and just running with that until your kid is old enough to decide whether that actually fits or not, and not doing any surgery until they're 18 and can make that decision for themselves. Because there's a lot of complications when you try to operate on itty-bitty baby genitals. So, and it, it's really, it's not for their benefit, it's just for society's benefit so they don't have to deal with the discomfort of being reminded that the gender binary isn't real. <laughs> so um, it's something that's still being fought. There's a couple intersex organizations that are fighting to try and get that changed, hopefully legally, so that you don't have any crusading doctors trying to change what a child is born as. So. All right, Dory Mooningham, everyone. <laughs>